The cold days of winter are around the corner and it's time to move those indoor plants back inside along with your green thumb. You don't have to give up gardening just because the weather is cold. We have some great tips to help those indoor plants survive and thrive in the winter. Garden Time is brought to you by Capital Subaru in Salem, Oregon. Hi, I'm Sarah with Portland Nursery, where our passion for plants has kept us rooted in this incredible community. A lot has changed since we first opened our doors, but through it all, we've remained family owned and operated, dedicated to providing our neighbors the largest selection of the highest quality plants Portland has to offer. With hundreds of new plants arriving each week, you're guaranteed to find something exciting and unique. Portland Nursery, a passion for plants at 50th and Stark, 90th and Division. Here at Capital Subaru, we are family. From you, our customers, our coworkers, and even our actual family members work here. This is my son, Casey. We're generations ahead of the competition, and we're always working to keep you and your family moving. We're here for you. We make it easy to join our Capital Subaru family. All the support you need, from sales and financing, to service and parts. We'll be here for you for generations to come. And generations after that. I'm Blake. And I'm Casey. We make it easy to join our Capital Subaru family. Where it's your, your way, way on, on the, the parkway. parkway. Welcome to the Garden Time Podcast. We're based in the Pacific Northwest of the United States in a Zone 8 region. This zone deals with plants that can survive in 10 degrees Fahrenheit or warmer. I'm producer Jeff Gustin with your hosts Judy Alaruzzo and Ryan Seeley. Welcome to Garden Time's podcast. We're at Portland Nursery on Division and we're with Jared. And so, you know, it's fall now and our house plants have been growing wonderfully in our house, but it's a little change of season. So Jared's gonna give us some tips to have our house plants happy for the rest of the year. So Jared, you know, um, things are changing, the light levels are mm -hmm. changing, the heat is on now. So yep. what, ha what is gonna be happening with our plants indoors? Yeah, so a lot of changes are gonna be happening. Um, we're gonna be ch turning on our heaters, turning off our ACs, um, maybe opening the windows or not. Everyone's house is gonna have different levels of humidity and lighting, and we're gonna get less lighting every day. So these are really important things to start t um, considering. So everyone's house is different. You might have uh, you might have radiators versus forced air heating. Forced air heating will make your house a lot drier, especially those areas near those house plants. So make sure to keep them away from vents if you can. You might have a drafty window, which might get cold. So just kind of be aware of your space and you have to start considering like changing watering habits. You might need to water more or less. Um, you would need to water less because of light, but maybe more because it's drier. So always putting your finger in the soil and <laughs> Checking to see how wet it is is going to be the best way to tell. Um, don't go on a calendar. Don't go on a weekly schedule. Just because right, that right. worked for you all summer long. Right. To, okay, every Sunday I'm going to water it. Yeah. You know, getting into those times you might need to adjust that. Exactly. We're colder this week. Right, yeah. right. Yep. And should we be moving our plants? Maybe they were five feet away from a window, but now there's not a lot of light coming, so they should be closer, but still out of a draft. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So to a, a brighter window, if you have a different brighter window, closer to a window, maybe even rotate your plants. Sometimes you want even light on the different sizes of the plant. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that is good. And so, you know, some of us have had, you know, like I use a lot of house plants outside yeah. um, during, during the summertime as, as either foliage containers. And it's getting to be a little on the cooler side yes. where it's time to bring some of those back inside. Yeah, definitely. So some plants don't, a lot of their true tropical plants, like this Diffenbachia here, never want to be below, uh, I believe, 60 degrees, 60 mm -hmm. degrees Fahrenheit. So if you did have it outdoors in the summer, then definitely those pure tropics need to be inside when it's cool. Mm -hmm. um, some, like your cactus or your citrus, some of those can take a lot colder, like maybe just to 40 or something like that. Anything where you're keeping it outside for a really long period of time, you'll want to transition it inside slowly if you can. In the winter, they're used to being outdoors, so getting a lot of light, getting a lot of humidity. And our houses are drier, so bring it inside for a few hours a day. Outside, inside for a few more hours. Maybe over the course of a week would be a good way to adjust it slowly to that yeah. abrupt change. And keep in mind, some plants might get a little stressed and drop their leaves. It's not the end of the world. But they, they can recover from that. And they'll yeah. kind of let you know that they're a little, little stressed. They'll out. regrow, it might take some time, but yeah. it's not a problem. So the plants that have been, been outside, you know, is there concerns, you know, like once we're acclimating and bringing them in, what do we need to look at on, on the plants as we transition those in? Yeah, so you bring your outdoor plants in, you bring the outside in with them. <laughs> you might get creepy crawlies. Um, I've seen snails and slugs are like, they're not pests, but they might uh, 
hop along with the, the plants, but you also might get true pests. You might get mealybug or scale or spider mites or some of those things that are real pests, fungus gnats. Um, so it's important to start uh, keeping in mind when you're bringing those guys inside. One thing I do to all my plants when I bring them inside myself is uh, diatomaceous earth. It's, uh, it's a fine dust that messes up bugs as they crawl through it. It has to be dry and the bug has to physically crawl through it um, for it to work. So I bring my plants in, I water them, I give them a day or two to dry out, and then, um, and then I'll, I'll coat the surface of the soil and the water dish so that any centipede or whatever that crawls out of the bottom of the pot will get that stuff on them and then they'll not be happy anymore. Um, that, that doesn't go on the actual leaf, though. That goes around the soil. Yeah, you could put it on the leaf, too, but the bug has to crawl over it, so okay. soil's going to be more effective. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you don't think about those kind of bigger, bigger insects coming in, yeah. so that's a really great idea and pretty easy to take care of that. Super easy, yeah. yeah. Because I like you said, you know, you get up those drainage holes on the bottom of the yeah. pot where yeah. you'll get something that crawls in from outside. Right. It's a great place for a slug and the snail to get right. in yep. there and yeah. little creepy crawlies that yep. you kind of forget about some of those areas. Yeah. Another big one that you can put in the soil is going to be um, mosquito bits. So this is a thing. Uh, it's little granules that have a bacteria that kill fungus gnats. And fungus gnats, you might see them. They look like fruit flies, but a little smaller. And they live in wet soil. So your outdoor plant brought it inside, you might not care because you see a gnat outside, you never care. But all of a sudden you have a bunch of, you think fruit flies ha flying in your house, it might be the, the fungus gnat. So putting that into your soil is gonna help out. Um, you can soak some of that, like a small handful in your watering can for 15, 20 minutes, shake it up and then water your plants and that'll, that one treatment of that should take care of a lot of fungus gnats. Oh, do, do you ever need to, you know, if you <clears throat> feel like you have a lot of like fungus gnats, do you want to ever like, re you know, replace the soil or take some of the soil off and redo it? Or is I, don't it find, I don't find that super effective because if you miss some, you miss some. Another thing you can do though is cover the so surface. The fungus gnat only live in the first approximately like two inches of soil. Okay. So one treatment is letting your plants dry out a bit between watering. Some plants can take that. So if the top two inches of your plant dry, it's going to be really hard for them to grow. Or it, to stop them from getting into the surface, you can put sand or some other thick covering over the top and then the fungus gnats don't go into the soil. Oh, great. Gotcha. But I don't like to trade the soil out. Right. Okay. And do you recommend maybe washing the plants down when they come or really oh, yeah. inspecting them? Because you might find a lot of issues then. Of course, yeah, that's super important. Um, mostly a lot of the pests that we get that are true pests I like to hang out on the newest growth. So focusing on the new growth is a really helpful thing to do. Getting a strong mist, if the plant can take it, uh, a hose just before you bring it inside, mm -hmm. hose the leaf off. That'll wash a lot of things off. They're not as strong as a hose typically. Um, but yeah, a good close look, the bottom of the leaf, um, plants that have like a crevice where the stem and the leaf meet, check in there. Um, mealybug is a, is a common one that likes to hide in places. They're a really white, fuzzy looking uh, insect, maybe a centimeter or smaller, but they'll hide in all those nooks and crannies, the in between the leaves, underside of the leaf, a new leaf opening up, that kind of stuff. And what's a good control for that? Yeah, then? so mealybug and scale, two similar things. Scale kind of has like a hard surface. Mealy is white and fuzzy. Um, you can use uh, a few different things. One thing for houseplants especially, I like to use um, to start out with a systemic. So this houseplant systemic is a pesticide or insecticide. You put it in your houseplant soil, it goes up and through the plant, and then once the insect eats it, it dies. So it is a little uh, bit more on the harsh chemical side. I don't mind too much for my house plants because especially the ones that I keep inside all year, it's mm -hmm. never going to affect the pollinators or anything outside. Right. So you put it in your soil and hopefully you don't have a bunch of bees in your house. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not flowering. Right. So. They're not flowering. Right. So, so it, that's the surefire way to take care of any insect on your plants. It does take time. Mm -hmm. I've always heard roughly about six inches per week for it to go up through your plant. So you're really long vines your big trees, you might need to apply it once a month for it to actually go it all the way okay. through that. Okay. So that's the long-term thing. While, while that is working its way through the plant, those things might still be living on the surface, so it's good to do a spray. A um, few different options. My favorite thing to do, a simple thing, is um, a kind of insect killing soap. This is specifically to kill insects, so it's really effective at killing the ones you hit. So you have to hit them. It won't work on the ones you miss, which is where the systemic comes in. Um, and this should take care of most things. The mealybug and scale, sometimes they need to be hit a few times for it to work. Another popular thing to use is uh, neem oil. So this is an oil 
uh, derived from the neem plant. And um, oils in general, when you're spraying them for bugs, they cover the bug. Bugs need to breathe on their skin and it stops them from breathing. So it can take care of them. Um, one thing I'd like to caution for using for your house plants is if you're spraying this oil all over your leaf, it doesn't really leave. And I find it can leave a little bit of a sticky residue. So you might want to follow up with a wipe eventually to get that oil off. I know my cat hair always sticks to it. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. when I'm going to bring them in from outside, you know, a lot of times, you know, there's just the dust and the outdoor right. airs, you know, especially on the, you know, some of the green foliage, you can really kind of see some, some buildup. Yeah. You know, is there products when you're going to actually like clean the leaves? Mm -hmm. I know you can ho hose them off, but sometimes yeah. they need a little bit so, more than that. So you can use the neem oil for that. And there is also leaf shines. Um, this one? Leaf shine, yeah. So there's a leaf, uh, uh, like a, this is purely just put on a clo cloth, wipe your leaves down, makes them look nice and fresh. Even if you haven't brought it up from outside, they build up dust. Um, right. So you can use this or neem oil, both will work for that. And that doesn't harm the plant at all? In the no. Gives uh, it like a nice glossy. The one look. thing I would avoid, any cactus or succulent. You generally okay. don't want to use um, a, leaf, a leaf shine or a neem oil on, uh, or any oil product on them. They actually have pores, kind of like we do. Right. And if you cover them with an oil, it blocks the pores, which is not good for them. But other plants, normal leafy plants, it's good. Okay. And then I see that you have um, something for mites, spider mites. And yeah. so if you can explain what that looks like, the symptom of that. Yeah, so spider mites, much smaller than the other bugs we're talking about. You might be able to see them if you, uh, sometimes if you, you have a very, like, like this plant is a very white leaf. You might see tiny, tiny orange dots, orange or red dots on them. Sometimes if you're not sure, I suggest getting like a white piece of paper and kind of tapping your plant. You might see little dots on there. You might not be able to if you don't have the best vision. Um, you can always bring plants in here if you want us to help you figure out these specific pests. Um, but mostly you'll see a very um, kind of like static-like pattern, especially if it's a nice green leaf on the newest growth. It'll try to grow in on these bugs they feed by piercing and then sucking out the green juice. Mm -hmm. And so they'll do that kind of in a random pattern that'll look like static. So green with a tan background. And if you're seeing your new plants kind of have that color pattern, or maybe they're just growing in smaller or twisted, mm -hmm. um, anything like that might be a sign of spider mite. If you, it's gone really long, then they'll actually have webs. That's where the spider part of the name oh, comes yeah. from. So you'll have webs, webs kind of not like a big spider web, like between leaves, but like over the surface of, surface of a leaf, or maybe like between really close things. Okay. So if you see a faint web with a bunch of orange dots on it, that's spider mite. And then, yeah, we do have the mite X here. Um, and that has a few, uh, I would say, harsher oils. So it has um, cottonseed, clove, and garlic oil. Okay. It doesn't smell like garlic, surprisingly. Oh. Just, <laughs> it, smell, it doesn't smell bad. It smells like clove oil. But the clove and garlic oil are a lot harsher and will take yeah. care of them pretty well. Yeah. And so these are all good, good tips, you know, for you know plants that we're bringing indoors, but also the plants that you know stay inside yeah, all, all the time. And this yeah. is kind of not just a wintertime thing. I mean, we kind of always want to be scouting. Yeah, always be scouting is always important. Um, always checking out your new growth. I know it's really it, impressive when like a Monstera opens up its new leaf or whatever. Right. So whenever you're seeing those, we're always excited for a new leaf, but check it critically too, not just out of excitement. It's the time to kind of really enjoy them, but then you're also scouting too. So yeah. I think that that is kind of a twofold thing. You see what's going on with them. Yeah, of course. And then is there, you know, on the, on the house plants, you know, as we're maybe transitioning them from inside, you know, we've maybe unpotted them from a big container and repotted uh -huh. them. What about our house plants in general? Is there a certain time a year that it's better to transplant than yeah. others as we're going into the winter yeah, months? Yes, generally spring is, I would say, the best time. Um, if you have grow lights, you could probably do it any time of year, but spring when we're getting the most light, it's warmer, or even though these are tropical plants, we have our seasonal cycles here. Mm -hmm. So taking advantage of that, Repotting is always a bit of a stressful time, so giving them a good time to come out of that stress. So a lot of light, maybe give them a, a fertilizer whenever you transplant, that kind of thing, just so they can come back faster. So I wouldn't suggest doing it in the fall if you can help it. Okay. I do see some fertilizer here, so mm -hmm. would we want to look and may maybe do a fertilizer dose this time of year? Yeah, especially yeah, like if you we're having them outside and bring them inside, probably watering them a lot more heavy if you're using a hose or a watering can than if you're inside, so you might be flushing a lot of that fertilizer out. Generally, like I said, we're not doing a lot of growth, a lot of in the in the winter or in the fall, unless you have grow lights. Um, <laughs> but it, you, can, you can definitely do a fertilizer in the fall. Maybe I would just do one, unless it's a cactus or succulent. I wouldn't do any fertilizer for cactus or succulent in the winter. 
but maybe one ap application, maybe two over the fall and the winter would be fine. Um, just something light. I like to do liquid fertilizers myself. Uh, it's really easy to control. You, if you need to use less, uh, less is more for houseplants, I generally say. So you can always add a few drops to your watering can or whatever the, I normally do like half of the recommended dose okay. for the slower months. And you just add it to your water and that's probably a simple way to do the fertilizer. Yeah. You have such a beautiful selection here. Mm, it is amazing you. to come to the Portland Nursery on Division. And if you're not in the, this area, really go to your independent garden center. You can see lovely house plants to bring in for the, for the uh, winter time because I think we miss being having all that greenery around. Yeah. You know, so we've talked about a lot of the, you know, the pests that can get on the mm -hmm. plants, but what about like disease issues? Is there yeah. anything we need to worry about on that? There's a few diseases. Most disease for plants are pretty specific to one plant group. So like ficus might get one, philodendron might get one, but it wouldn't share between them. Um, one kind of common one I might see is on begonias. Uh, maybe a few other plants like that, they'll get this thing called powdery mildew. Very light white covering to the leaf. Often that's a relation to water, too much water typically, or not enough air circulation. So if you are seeing some of your, especially your older leaves on your plants get that white covering, you can use a fungicide, um, but normally uh, that will only take care of the new leaves. It won't fix the old leaves. So normally you have to look at your environment. Uh, leaf diseases really like to have uh, stagnant air. So improving your circulation in your house, or if it's like in a damp corner of your house, maybe moving it away from that kind of scenario and maybe pulling back on water. A lot of times I, I have people come in that have leaves and they think something's going wrong. It's yellow, there's a spot on it. But normally, most of the time, like 90% of the time, I'd say it's uh, something environmental, whether that's water or a temperature thing. So before you jump to wanting to get some miracle spray to fix it, kind of look at your space to see if you have a cold pocket in your room or you need to pull back on watering or something like that. Jared, I appreciate all the information today as yeah, we course. transition into winter. You know, I'd like to thank Portland Nursery for having us out today. And if you're in the market, come down to their Division Street store or up to their Stark Street store. I'd also like to thank Capital Subaru for sponsoring us and we'll see you next time in the garden. Here at Capital Subaru, we are family. From you, our customers, our coworkers, and even our actual family members work here. This is my son, Casey. We're generations ahead of the competition, and we're always working to keep you and your family moving. We're here for you. We make it easy to join our Capital Subaru family. All the support you need, from sales and financing, to service and parts. We'll be here for you for generations to come. And generations after that. I'm Blake. And I'm Casey. We make it easy to join our Capital Subaru family. Where it's your, your way on the parkway. parkway. For 75 years, Al's Garden and Home has been a favorite destination of local gardeners. Starting in a small roadside fruit stand off of 99E in Woodburn by Al Biggie, Al's has grown to four retail locations in the Portland metro area that also includes a huge growing operation near Hubbard. To ensure that you get the highest quality, Al's grows over 80% of the plants they sell. This fourth generation family owned business is now one of the most recognized garden centers in the country. Stop by one of our four locations to learn why Owls is the first stop for Northwest Gardeners. Garden time is on the road again. Join us as we tour Spain and Portugal in September and October of 2024. We start in vibrant Barcelona, where we'll see some of Gaudi's best work, including a tour of La Sagrada Familia Basilica. Then we head to Valencia for a couple of days of touring Roman and Arabian architecture, seeing various markets and a little paella thrown in to tempt your palate. Our next stop is the city of Granada, where we'll take a tour of the famous Alhambra and its wonderful gardens. Then it's on to a couple days in Seville, the cultural capital of Spain. We'll walk through the massive cathedral with Columbus's tomb and enjoy an evening of flamenco. The more city of Cordoba and the Mesquita are next, with its wonderful mix of Spanish and Islamic influences. After this extraordinary stop, we jump on the AVE high-speed train and head to Madrid for a couple days. Our visit to Madrid will find us in the historic center of the city, with stops to see the Puerta del Sol and the Prado Museum. A side trip to historic Toledo, the medieval capital of Spain, is a stop on our way to Portugal. We finish our tour with three days in Lisbon, where we'll tour the palaces and gardens of royalty. Stops here include the Monument to the Discoveries and the Tower of Belém. 
We also have a day trip to the wonderful medieval town of Obidos. If you'd love to spend more time here, there are extensions available before and after our tour. Local transportation, hotels, and 20 of your meals are included. Book now as these Garden Time tours fill up quickly. Go to Garden Time Tours on our website and click on the little airplane for more information. And we'll see you in Europe.